a most exciting substitution, a last minute guest speaker who just came to our attention. And his name is Trace Mayer. He is an early Bitcoin adopter, an early Bitcoin investor, and he has some exciting material for you. Like you said, an impromptu guest, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background with Bitcoin. Uh, then I'll get into uh, some of my investments. And then a tremendous use case for Bitcoin that everybody, even people who hate Bitcoin, should use because you're able to save at least 20% uh, off of pretty much all your purchases. And uh, then going to talk a little bit about the network effects that you should be on uh, we have taking place with Bitcoin. So a little bit about myself. I'm an early Bitcoin adopter. I began publicly talking about and recommending and uh, evangelizing Bitcoin when it was a nickel. I host the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, which you can find at uh, www.bitcoin.kn. I interview all the top people in the Bitcoin space, uh, CEOs of all the main companies. I you know, we back in those early days when Bitcoin was a nickel, uh, people had dreams, they had ideas, they had things that they wanted to build. Uh, for example, the Armory wallet, Alan Reiner wanted to build out an ultra secure Bitcoin wallet so people's Bitcoins would be safe. Uh, so I funded him. Uh, there were two wild and crazy guys. They wanted merchants to be able to accept Bitcoin. Uh, so I funded BitPay. Uh, now Microsoft actually uh, accepts Bitcoin using BitPay along with uh, nine, nine to 10 other billion dollar plus merchants uh, and 55,000 other merchants. And then uh, Jesse Powell, he decided the Bitcoin needed an exchange because an exchange was the most critical piece of Bitcoin infrastructure. Uh, so I funded Kraken, which is the largest Euro Bitcoin exchange out there. Uh, and the list goes on. Uh, I've funded several other Bitcoin uh, endeavors and things like that, Bitcoin Magazine, uh, some others. So, you know, that's a little bit of my background. Like, why, why would I fund a wallet company? Well, it's because we have to know that our Bitcoins are safe, that they're secure. Uh, that's the foundation that the entire ecosystem is built on. When we're talking about keeping Bitcoin secure, well, what is Bitcoin? Like, what is it? What, what are we keeping secure? Well, at the end of the day, we're just keeping a number secure. It's based on public private key encryption. It's a protocol and we're just keeping a number secure. That number, uh, mathematics, it, it's a way for humans to abstract. With Bitcoin, we've abstracted a first use case, which is currency. Uh, but there will actually be thousands and thousands of use cases for Bitcoin. Uh, that can be applied in many different ways, just like with uh, the asset of gold. Uh, one application of gold is as currency, but we use it in electronics, we use it in computers, we use it in dental fillings. Uh, so likewise, Bitcoin will be used for so many other things. When we're using Bitcoin as currency, uh, and especially in these early days, we've had a lot of people, well, they hate Bitcoin, you know? I think it challenges something at the visceral heart of so many people. This idea that uh, the money that they use might not be trustworthy, might not be mathematically provable, might not be immutable or unalterable, you know, processes and uh, characteristics of the Bitcoin blockchain. And that, that might uh, concern them, you know, especially if their paychecks and their entire way that they've organized the world uh, has has come about because of their monetary system that they use, a debt-based monetary system, fractional reserve banking, central counterparty clearing with securities, all of these things now obsolete because of this new technology, just like bronze weapons became obsolete to steel weapons, and just like bows became obsolete to, to gunpowder and cannons. Uh, so likewise, uh, Bitcoin as a currency is just the first application. So even if you hate Bitcoin, like why should you use it? Well, my buddy Roger Ver, he funded a company called Purse.io. And the other day I decided, you know what, I'm gonna try using Purse.io. So I went onto Purse and I set up my account 
And uh, what you do is you go and you, you create a wish list on amazon.com. So I went over to Amazon and I, you know, did some of my normal shopping and put it all on this wish list. And then I imported it to my purse.io account and it was like a hundred dollars or something. And uh, then I sent my Bitcoins to purse.io, which got held in escrow. And then I set my discount and I set 35%. I only wanted to pay, pay 65 cents on the dollar for this Amazon wish list. Uh, and you know, it listed it in the order book. And within three hours, someone had bought my wish list for me. And within two days, I had the product in my hand and then they got the Bitcoins. Well, they, in effect, they buy the, they buy the product off Amazon. The, the question is, is, is it a reverse bidding or reverse auction? The discount that I, that I set the 35% discount, there's the spot price of the Bitcoins and then I get the 35% discount. And so it factors in that into the exchange rate for people who want to buy the Bitcoins. And so, you know, somebody bought the wish list and in exchange they got bitcoins now why would they want to do that well that's where this this trojan hydra of bitcoin it's not just a trojan horse it's a trojan hydra that's regenerable it can regenerate uh this trojan hydra of bitcoin is making markets more efficient what how's it making markets more efficient in this case with purse.io well I went to circle.com and bought my Bitcoins, you know, my hundred, my hundred dollars worth of Bitcoins. And I sent them over there uh, and I pay you know, pretty much 0% fees at circle. Uh, somebody, you know, maybe they're in Africa or Indonesia, maybe they do affiliate marketing for Amazon. Amazon has a big affiliate marketing program and they can't get paid with, with a bank account, you know, because Amazon only pays out to certain areas. And also Amazon only, ships to about 50 countries. So maybe they're getting paid by Amazon, but not through a bank account. And they're, they're getting paid with Amazon gift credit, but they can't spend the gift credit because they're in a country that Amazon doesn't ship to. Maybe Amazon should accept Bitcoin like Overstock because Overstock ships to all 215 countries. But I understand Amazon, you know, they can only take payment from credit cards and we only really have credit cards in 50 countries. So they're just seeding uh, 160 countries or so to overstock and just giving away the market, uh, which is not a very smart business move. And eventually Amazon will have to rectify that. Uh, but part of the problem is, is that this Amazon gift card credit, there's $15 billion of it. You know, this is money on Amazon's, uh, that Amazon's promised to people, but they can't really redeem it. Well, now they're able to redeem it for Bitcoin. And so even if you hate Bitcoin, even if you just absolutely loathe Bitcoin, how do you want to pay at Amazon? Do you want to pay with your American Express and get frequent flyer points? Do you want to pay with a debit card? Or do you want to pay with Bitcoin? Because at the very best, Starwoods points on your, your Starwoods uh, American Express card, those points are worth maybe 2.3 cents a piece which means on the $100 purchase, you're going to get about $2.30 worth of points back. Uh, but if you pay with purse, purse.io, and you pay with Bitcoins, the average discount, and they've done over 10,000 transactions so far, the average discount is 18%. Okay? So even if you hate Bitcoin, we're talking, you know, that's an eight to nine fold uh, eight to eight to nine, 800 to 900% increase in, in the effective rebate from using Bitcoin as a payment method. You can buy them instantaneously on circle. You're hardly exposed to any of the exchange rate risk of the Bitcoins. You get to set the discount that you want, uh, the lower your discount, the quicker, uh, the order will likely be filled because you know, your price is more attractive than the other prices in the order book. Uh, but that's just one example of this Trojan Hydra making a big, uh, making the overall economy much more efficient. How many billions of dollars are on gift cards right now? You know, and that's just talking about, you know, using a system like purse with the way gift cards are currently implemented. We'll actually be able to abstract these, these gift cards and rewards points. We'll be able to abstract all of them on top of the blockchain and then they'll be programmatically 
tradable atomically in the same transaction on the blockchain with no counterparty risk. The same that we're going to be doing with stocks and bonds and other financial assets. The same thing that we're going to be doing with cars that are self-driving, that'll be able to pay the mechanic themselves and then pay distributions to their shareholders. That'll all be handled on the blockchain, all be handled atomically, all be handled trustworthy uh, without any trust required. It's going to be very exciting how this technology uh, moves forward. So let's start, uh, you know, the previous speaker, he talked about a two-sided network effect. And, you know, when, when you have a network effect, uh, it, it increases the barrier uh, to entry and exit for competitors and for users. You know, you don't want to leave. Uh, you, everybody accepts credit cards, so we're all going to keep buying and spending with credit cards. There's got to be a really big incentive to get you to switch from using credit cards and dollars and bank accounts to using something else. Maybe 18% discounts enough to incentivize you to switch. I don't know. Uh, but you know, a net, a net of 15% might be, be good enough. Uh, you know, but, but we have to overcome these network effects. And so Bitcoin's actually got seven network effects taking place, taking root all at the same time. So let's march through them. First uh, is speculation. You know, everybody loves to chase the rabbit. Everybody loves when the prices go up and down. It generates lots of excitement. Like everybody just loves to chase the rabbit. Uh, you know, funny story with that. I was I was at an event with uh, Philip Munger. He's Charlie Munger's son. Charlie Munger's the uh, vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, multi-billionaire. And uh, and Warren Buffett. He was asked about Bitcoin. He said, "Oh, it's a mirage." And Charlie Munger. He was asked on TV, he said, oh, it's rat poison. And uh, on TV was also Bill Gates. And Bill Gates, he said, well, I think Bitcoin's a technological tour de force. You know, so, so who are you going to kind of take as an authority? Someone who built Microsoft or, you know, the greatest investors in the world? You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a toss up, right? Especially when you... Yeah, yeah. I mean, but but part of part of being the best investor in the world is owning the government, being able to get all that bailout money. I mean, you, you got to get a good return on investment for those political donations, right? So you know, it's but Bitcoin is complicated. Like, how do you how do you assess it if you're just kind of looking in on this? And so you know, Philip and I we're we're walking around looking at this fashion show and all the all the cute models and stuff. And he was like, well, you know, like what's your return been on Bitcoin? And I was like, uh, I, I don't know what you mean. And he was like, you know, like, what percentage up is it? And I was like, oh, I think I understand what you're saying. Well, I'm up about 2x. And he was like, only 2x? And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, in three years, I'm up about 2x what Berkshire Hathaway's up in the last 35. And he's like, like percentages. How about 280,000%? You know, so when we're talking about volatility and uh, potential for appreciation, I mean, this this gets fun, you know. And then, you know, I told him the biggest gains for Bitcoin could very well be in front of us. Uh, one of the earlier speakers talked about how it's a new asset class. This is really a new form of property. This is crypto property, property backed by cryptography. Uh, it's a new asset class. You know, we have we have trillions of dollars in stocks and trillions of dollars in bonds and trillions of dollars in currencies and in uh, commodities and and hundreds of trillions of dollars in real estate and derivatives and things of this nature. You know, those are all storage tanks that are filled up and the capital kind of moves between all of those storage tanks. Uh, and then we have crypto property or the cryptocurrency. We have Bitcoin and it, it's an empty storage tank. There's only three to four billion dollars in it right now. And yet, if it's going to become what it's destined to become, uh, we're talking trillions of dollars are going to have to be in this new asset class, this new form of property. Uh, and so that's speculation, you know, like people are kind of looking out into the future, they're discounting the probability that that's going to happen and that's going into the price. Uh, and speculation, you have to have security. You got to keep those Bitcoins safe. You know, everybody, everybody seems to get their Bitcoins stolen one way or the other. Uh, they let somebody else hold the private keys. 
you know, because that's just the way that we've, we've been conditioned with property for the last 5,000 years is somebody else holds the private keys, you know, the, the, the dollars in your bank account, you're actually an unsecured creditor. The, the dollars aren't there. Everybody knows it. It's called fractional reserve banking. Uh, we have reserve requirements. Uh, there's a mismatch between time deposits or, and uh, demand deposits. So, I mean, you know, the money's really not there. Uh, everybody kind of just hopes that when they need it, it'll be there. Uh, the Greeks are finding out it's not that way. The Argentines, the Venezuelans, uh, bailouts, bail-ins, you know, it's going to get fun. It's going to get real fun. And, you know, if, if, if the government, $17 trillion in debt, where are they going to get the money? Going to get the money from whoever's stupid enough to not hold the private keys to their own wealth. You know, so you, you take back control, sovereign control of the money, just like gold. You know, back when, when, when we were using gold as our international monetary system, uh, it was a lot harder to seize it because the gold was distributed widely among the populace. You had to actually go and, you know, stand there. The IRS agent stood there uh, when people opened their safety deposit boxes, when Franklin Roosevelt made it illegal to own gold. Uh, you know, when, when Hitler made it illegal to own gold, you know, they're SS right there, get your gold. Mao made it illegal to own gold. Uh, Stalin made it illegal to own gold. You know, so it's, it's, it's definitely gonna evoke strong emotions on one side or the other. If you want to hold your own assets, then you like Bitcoin. If you want somebody else to have control over you and your assets, then you don't like Bitcoin. Uh, it's really kind of a one or a zero game. You know, that's how cryptography works. It's just math. And at the end of the day, violence can't solve a math problem. That's just not how math works. And I mean, you can't just aim like the nuclear bomb at the Bitcoin algorithm and obliterate it. Like it just, Math is math, and you either have the answer or you don't. So Bitcoin's a little different than gold in that sense. You can't just kill somebody and, and get the purchasing power of the Bitcoin. I mean, you have to actually got to get those private keys one way or the other. Uh, and I've had some friends, you know, they sent their Bitcoins to the wrong address. That's a problem. Uh, so they see the Bitcoin sitting there, and there is no way that anybody's getting those Bitcoins. It's, it's quite a problem. So, you know, we have to keep our, our Bitcoin safe. That's security. It's the foundation for speculation. Then our next network effect is going to be merchants. You know, now that people got Bitcoins, they want to spend them, you know? So we got merchants adopting Bitcoin. BitPay's got uh, 50, 60,000 merchants, same with Coinbase. We've got uh, processors that make it super easy for merchants to accept Bitcoin, 0% fees. You know, you get an instantaneous, uh, no chargebacks, no fees, direct deposit comes the next day in dollars if you don't want any exchange rate risk. There's no reason for a merchant not to accept Bitcoin. Uh, you add two lines of code to your website, you're up and running taking Bitcoin. Uh, you know, then you can take customers that everybody else can't uh, until everybody's accepting Bitcoin and then we got more network effects taking place. Now that merchants are accepting Bitcoin, well, there, there are consumers that will pay uh, and will buy stuff only using Bitcoin. Who might those merchants be? Well, I already talked about them. We got 150 countries that don't have credit cards. Uh, one out of three credit card transactions from Africa is fraudulent. So, I mean, you just, as a merchant, you just aren't gonna accept payment from somebody in Africa. You're just not gonna serve that market because of the cost of the chargeback. Additionally, man, hackers, they love credit cards. You know, why do they love credit cards? Because the bigger the, the, the bigger the entity, you know, like Home Depot, the bigger the database. And so there's actually reverse economies of scale when it comes to credit cards. Who does the hacker want to steal credit card data from? The little merchant with 5,000 people in the database? or the big merchant like Home Depot with 55 million in the database. And so that's why merchants have huge costs accepting credit cards. They have chargebacks, they have fraud, they have PCI compliance, uh, all types of, of expensive things. 
Uh, and then customers have expenses with credit cards. They have to give their name and their address and their, and their credit card number. I mean, how stupid is it to put the private key out in the public for everybody to be able to steal? I mean, it's just insane. So, you know, we have all these problems uh, that keep some people out of the system of using credit cards. They might very well want to use Bitcoin. And if a merchant can accept it and pay no fees and not be exposed to any exchange rate risk, why not accept it? So that's why we're seeing a lot of merchant adoption. Uh, so we got our speculation, we've got our merchants, we got our consumers. You know, all of this increases demand for Bitcoin. We often don't really talk about the demand for money, uh, but just like the supply of money, you know, with the Federal Reserve, you can just do control P and just keep printing, you know, more of these dollars. They're not limited in amount. You can just print as many as you want. We've been printing trillions of them over the last few years, uh, mainly giving them to people like Warren Buffett uh, and, and the banks that got bailed out. Uh, so, you know, the way they're created, we don't really know. It gets handed out in an arbitrary way based on political favor. Uh, but Bitcoin, we know exactly how many Bitcoins there are. We know exactly how many Bitcoins there will be in the future. We know exactly how the Bitcoins are distributed. It's all done according to math. It's all provable. Uh, that might increase demand for that particular asset. As the demand increases, the price goes up. As the price goes up, we have more people come in and secure the Bitcoin network. So that makes it even more powerful and resilient. Uh, in terms of numbers, it's now at least a hundred thousand times more processing power than the hundred than like the 500 largest supercomputers combined. Uh, so the Bitcoin network is orders of magnitude larger than any other distributed computing network ever in the history of the world. It's just, it boggles the mind how much processing power has gone into the proof of work that secures that blockchain. So that's the security, you know, so there, now we got four network effects. Cause if you're going to have some other son of Bitcoin, you know, as Jeremy O'Leary said, if you're going to have some other digital currency overcome Bitcoin, what's going to have to overcome all these network effects in order to do that? Uh, number five, well, you know, if we've got merchants and consumers and, and security and speculation, what's going to get the developer mind share? Like, why did the developers go and build the Apple App Store instead of the BlackBerry Store? You know, when all the developers started working and tinkering on Apple stuff, that was two years before BlackBerry stock cratered and jumped off a cliff like a bunch of lemmings. Uh, and Apple stock, you know, Apple's probably going to be the first trillion dollar market cap company here pretty soon. Why? Because the developers make the piece of glass useful and valuable for the consumers who want to buy it. And so that's all part of the network effect. Well, guess what? At Money 2020, the premier payments conference in the world, uh, they had a hackathon. There were 450 people that participated in the hackathon. There was a prize given out for each system that you decided to, to build something for, uh, which you know, so you knew that you'd at least be given a prize if you worked on MasterCard's API or, or Visa's. Well, two people built a project on MasterCard's API. Uh, I think three people built one on Visa's API. Uh, over 80% built a blockchain, a, a Bitcoin related project. Over 80% of the people in the hackathon. All the developers, what are they building on when it comes to new financial services? Bitcoin. You know, so the developer mindshare, all the people who make the innovation, who make things more useful, they're all building on Bitcoin. Why is that? Mainly because Bitcoin's a dumb network. It's very uh, predictable. You know, we have the rules. Anybody can access it. Uh, and so it allows for very smart devices as opposed to a smart network. Uh, which would be like the Federal Reserve that has to interact with very dumb devices uh, like Fedwire. It enables for innovation without permission, and it enables this innovation to happen at the edges. And so Bitcoin, uh, by its very nature, will outcompete in terms of innovative resources 
uh, any other monetary system out there uh, that is uh, not uh, dumb in that sense. Uh, so it's a very, very good, good place for Bitcoin to be in. And if you're going to be developing an altcoin stuff, uh, developing a digital currency thing, why develop uh, some other altcoin? Why not just develop on Bitcoin? So uh, that's one of the reasons why we have thousands of projects in GitHub that are all being developed out by Bitcoin developers. Well, now we get to the six network effect. And we just saw massive news about this yesterday. Uh, no John Betts, the CEO of Noble Markets, uh, is going to be using NASDAQ's uh, trading software for his exchange. Uh, I've recently interviewed Paul Chow. He's the CEO of LedgerX uh, for my Bitcoin Knowledge podcast. Uh, and LedgerX is going to be doing is going to be a swap execution facility for Bitcoin derivatives. Uh, and they're working on getting their uh, regulatory uh, approval from the CFTC. Well, what's that sixth network effect? It's I like to call it financialization or uh, where the real guts of our financial system get creatively destroyed as Bitcoin moves into it, as Wall Street and Beijing and Hong Kong and Singapore and the Netherlands and London uh, all come in and, and bring the massive amounts of wealth into this new form of crypto property, into this empty storage tank. What will happen from all six of these network effects? Well, hopefully in 10, 20 years down the road at the very largest uh, kind of vision that I could see is that we'll have the seventh network effect, which will be world reserve currency status. We will be settling all forms of property rights into the blockchain. You'll be able to trade a house with all of its tenants paying their, their rents and whatnot, you'll, you'll trade that house for the Bitcoins atomically in the blockchain. Like, why do we trust the, the, the property registries in our local county courthouses? Why wouldn't we just trust the blockchain? You know, one of the uh, attorney generals for a major state, you know, we, we asked him, well, what's the, what's the biggest problem that you got? And he's like, we have thousands of people calling us every week that can't find the title to their house. We could put it right in the blockchain, instantly look it up. You know, no more, no more chain of title searches, no more title insurance. Bam, right in the blockchain, trade it for the Bitcoins in the same transaction. The, the locks that, that you get into and out of the condo or the house, you, you've now switched that, uh, switched the keys that activate and allow you into that. And it's all being done, it could all be done with Bitcoin. Uh, and that, and it could affect real estate, not just in the United States, not just in Europe, but, but real estate anywhere in the world. And cars and planes and boats. Uh, you know, it could be Chevron trading a refinery to, uh, to ConocoPhillips 66. And it could be that refinery and all the property within that refinery and all the contracts that have been made with that refinery and the payments channel that's, that's automatically paying for and settling uh, for the oil that's coming in from the producers, all being handled uh, in a very automated way through the blockchain, but yet completely trustlessly. Uh, that's you know, what I'm talking about in that seventh network effect, people and corporations and institutions settling uh, into Bitcoin. You know, we tried to do this with gold. Uh, Isaac Newton, he came up with the gold standard, uh, which, you know, tried to settle the, the balance of payments and, and the capital flows between the na different nations and things like that. But gold was a very crude ledger to accomplish these things. And at the end of the day, uh, Bitcoin is triple entry bookkeeping, the first practical implementation of it that we've ever had. We, o we only developed double entry bookkeeping, uh, you know, in the 14th century or so. Uh, and that led to the accumulation of capital and the building up of the corporate structure and all of these types of things, our ability to account and, uh, and, and like measure our wealth. But now we're going to be able to do it in a, in a triple entry bookkeeping way, a way where the ledger is distributed, where it's immutable, where it's unchangeable, 
uh, we'll be able to have history that you can't rewrite. SEC filings that you can't change ever. You know, it's, it's going to be very fun, very exciting. Uh, and with that, I suppose I'm done. Kind of ran out of stuff. Maybe we have some questions that people want to ask. Yeah, so, so how do we make Bitcoin easier for people to understand? Uh, I think 18% discount is pretty easy to understand. And if somebody doesn't get that, like, they got a problem. Um, I mean, it literally, you, you get your circle account set up, you can buy $500 worth of Bitcoins, instantly withdraw them. Uh, takes maybe five to 10 minutes to, uh, to do that. You get Bread Wallet on your iPhone. It's a free wallet, uh, very secure. I interviewed Aaron Boisin, the CEO of Bread Wallet, on my podcast, and we talked all about it. If you want to learn more about it, free app. Withdraw the Bitcoins from Circle to your Bread Wallet. Set up your purse account. Get your Amazon wish list. Buy some big, buy something off Amazon with your Bitcoins. Get a twenty percent, twenty five percent discount. That should be pretty easy for people to understand, even if they just hate Bitcoin, even if they just loathe Bitcoin, 25% uh, discount. I mean, it should be pretty self-evident, you know, and from there, you know, once people start realizing how useful and what the utility of it is, uh, they'll find other uses for it. They'll find other ways that it can make their life more efficient and add more wealth and value to them. Uh, so the question is, how does one acquire Bitcoins? Uh, you can you can get them gifted to you. You could uh, buy them on Circle.com or another exchange like Kraken.com. Uh, yeah, you could sell your own products or services and accept Bitcoins. Uh, you could uh, get gifted Bitcoins. You could try to mine, although I wouldn't really recommend that currently. It's extremely competitive and specialized now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it, I think it's really great for people to uh, trade their goods or services for Bitcoins, particularly if it's a service, you know, then you're just trading some time and you get to play with this new technology. At the end of the day, it's a new technology. We know how to send emails. We know how to, you know, use a calculator and calculate change and write checks and use credit cards. Get with the times, you know, you, you, you need to, you need to be digitally literate in, as we move forward into uh, this new era. And if you're not, you know, like if the robot's not cleaning my toilet, I might hire you. So, you know, that's just how it's going to play out. And uh, so it's very important for people to, you know, take an active role in their own financial circumstances and well-being. Because at the end of the day, nobody cares about your financial circumstances more than you do. Any other questions? Why, why would corporations... Oh, like, which, so which companies currently accept a Bitcoin? Uh, there's over 100,000 merchants that have integrated with Bitcoin now. Uh, Overstock, Newegg, Microsoft, Tiger Direct, uh, Dell. You know, those are just some of the big publicly traded ones. Zynga is another billion dollar company. I mean, Namecheap, uh, private internet access if you want VPN services. Uh, there's, I mean, there's pretty much anything that you want to buy, like you can figure out a way to buy it with Bitcoin if you're got a little bit of ingenuity. Oh, the, the NFL accepts it? Yeah, you know what we need? Like I went to a Knicks game uh, the other night and of course like showed up absolutely way too late with my brother-in-law. And so we had to get scalped for our tickets. Um, we didn't know whether the tickets were valid or not when we're getting scalped, right? So, so the guy had to like walk us up to the line. I mean, wouldn't it be great if the tickets were issued on the blockchain and, and he could just transfer the tickets to us and the Bitcoins in the same transaction atomically and it'd be completely trustless, uh, trustless and, and I, I mean, Bitcoin, so many applications and so many different ways to make life easier. Uh, another question? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin, I, Personally, I think it's good for Bitcoin to grow in a very organic way like this. Uh, you know, my, my companies like Armory and BitPay and Kraken, they, they just get overloaded uh, when the price goes up. 
But you know, each time we, we have the, the price goes up and it brings a new media cycle and tons of new users come in, you know, and then it settles down. It lets us build out more and more of this core infrastructure. And so I, I think it's very good for Bitcoin to, to grow in this type of a way. You know, people want it to grow so fast overnight, but they're not the ones actually building the stuff out. You know, they're not the ones dealing with the customers and dealing with, uh, you know, getting this software built and stuff like that. So, I, I mean, I think it's, I think Bitcoin is doing great right now. If anything, it's a little bit further ahead than where I kind of estimated it to be at the current time. Um, but, you know, it's, it's moving along just great. And I've never been more bullish about Bitcoin. Uh, I think about probably about eight to 10 months ago, I think Bitcoin passed the point of no return. Uh, before that, it was very much proof of concept, but now I think it's past that point of no return. It will be the internet protocol for transferring value. Uh, it's just got too many network effects. Nothing's going to overcome that. Uh, and so, you know, that's, it's just a matter of building it all out now. So the question is, what comes first, the audience or the infrastructure? Um, I think, you know, it, obviously we have to have some audience that comes in, but it, it, we've seen it come in waves, you know, and, uh, for example, I was talking with Tony, uh, he's our chairman of the board there at BitPay. And, you know, I was asking him, you know, what's kind of the state of all of our merchant adoption right now? And he was like, well, you know, I think we've kind of, uh, we've got enough merchants accepting Bitcoin. What we need now is we need to find ways for people to pay, get paid in Bitcoin. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm actively out there scouting for, you know, a deal kind of like Bitwage. Uh, Bitwage lets you allocate a portion of your paycheck uh, to automatically get converted into Bitcoins and sent to your address. So, you know, as, as we move further down these network effects, you know, there, all these network effects are taking hold at the same time, but some of them, I think, take hold faster than others. And so we kind of naturally need to be rebalancing in those areas. I know with Armory, uh, we have got huge, huge innovations that have been coming out. We've got uh, completely distributed hierarchical deterministic multi-signature cold storage that's on the horizon uh, with sufficiently uh, distributed fragmented backups and the ways to protect the keys and be able to rotate managers in and out uh, along with key, key ceremonies for generation. So that's going to, you know, we don't, you can't go and, and tell a bank or a big corporation to put a hundred million dollars into Bitcoin, you know, six months ago, like the, the infrastructure just wasn't built. Like they couldn't meet their fiduciary duties <laughs> very ad hoc. But now with, with the software that we've built at Armory, yeah, you can put in $10 billion, $10 billion and the cybersecurity and the, the other security around it is being done properly with HSMs and uh, audited information system security standards and all that type of stuff. So, you know, I think, I think we've got a, you know, we've got a lot of work done, but we're able to take these best practices for, from other disciplines and areas and apply them to Bitcoin. Cause I mean, we protect private keys. It's not something new, you know, private keys to nuclear weapons, private keys to banks, uh, private keys to all types of things. And so, but we have to build that out specifically tailored for a Bitcoin application, which Armory, we've, I mean, we've got those, those solutions built now. So the institutions can come in uh, and BitPay makes it easy for them to. <laughs> and then once, once they start accepting Bitcoin and they start paying out employees in Bitcoin and things like that, well, now they got to hold Bitcoins on their treasury uh, in their treasury accounts, you know, they got to hold two or 3% of their cash balances in Bitcoin. I mean, Apple alone has $178 billion of cash. If they were to hold 3% in Bitcoin, I mean, they'd have to allocate in several times the current market cap of Bitcoin. And what's the actual saleable amount of Bitcoin out of the 13 to 14 million coins that have already been generated, probably three to 4 million at least are lost one way or the other and will never be recovered. So they're completely unsaleable. Then you got other Bitcoins that are held by people who don't need to sell them. And you're, and one of the great things about Bitcoin, it's an equity-based monetary system. So there are no margin calls 
Like if you want to get those Bitcoins from somebody, you pretty much have to get them from them consensually through trade or something. Uh, and they don't need, you know, the people holding them, they don't need to sell them. They can just sit on them, keep letting the price go up as the capital gets allocated into the cash balances. I mean, this, this vortex that's just going to, to suck in so much of the world's capital, it's going to be a wealth transfer, the likes of which humanity has never seen and probably won't ever see again for a long, long time. Well, I, I think I think those particular use cases where we're go, where we're going to be abstracting the ownership of like land titles and cars onto the blockchain, I think that's going to be much further down the road. Uh, I mean, we've got we've got Blythe Masters, former J.P. Morgan head of commodities. She's now CEO of DA at, uh, DA Holdings, Digital Asset Holdings, and she wants to create a way to have no counterparty risk. Uh, in the trading of securities. So she's starting with just trading fiat currencies and Bitcoin. But yeah, she'll, I, I imagine she's going to want to expand to other assets. It's just a matter of just getting it all built out. I mean, we can't just leap to like step 10, right? We gotta, we gotta go plot along methodically, logically, very well planned, uh, safely, conservatively, uh, which is you know how we operate stuff at the core level of Bitcoin when it comes to the protocol, uh, when it comes to security with things like Armory, you know, we, we don't want any attack surface, no attack vectors. We want all of, all of the risks foreclosed and precluded. Yeah, so the question is, uh, with all the potential applications of Bitcoin, what effect could that have on jobs and, and unemployment? You know, like we, we don't use horses anymore. We use cars. Horse populations actually peaked and then began declining at the introduction of the automobile uh, because horses became obsolete. Uh, with Bitcoin and, and robots that will be coming, you know, it's going to be, we're, we're in for a lot of change. Uh, the sheer amount of human labor that's going to be needed uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's kind of like what happened during the Great Depression. We had the advent of electricity and washing machines and like all of this stuff, all of this technology that freed up people's time from having to be spent uh, just carrying on day-to-day -day labor. Hopefully, the wealth transfer and wealth uh, distribution will be in a, what some would say like a fair or equitable way. Uh, for example, our current monetary system siphons off so much of our productivity, so much of our uh, standard of living. To give you an example, when my father was your age, uh, he graduated from school and he had two job offers. One was with the accounting firm, another was with the railroad. And he took the job with the railroad, uh, which paid $900 a month. At the time, that would buy 25.7 ounces of gold per month. So an, a kid with no experience, just graduating from college, getting his first job, earning in today's money, $500,000 a year. That's how much our politicians, that's how much our major corporations and our current political process has siphoned off our standard of living uh, for the average person. We, we just aren't benefiting from all these advancements that have taken place in information systems uh, and the internet and, and all, the, all this stuff. How will that political issue be solved? I don't know. You know, like all throughout history, whenever we have the collapse of a monetary system, uh, the, the populace is presented with two choices. There's repression, or regeneration. Uh, the US Constitution that came out of the collapse of the continental dollar, uh, regeneration. Uh, when, the, when John Law made it illegal, got the king to make it illegal to have gold and silver in France, and then the Jacobites uh, actually instituted the death penalty for using gold and silver to protect against the debased asinots, it led to the reign of terror, where they drug out something like 30,000 of the elites and politicians and beheaded them uh, in the guillotines. 
So, you know, when you have the collapse of the, the right mark, uh, it, you got repression with Hitler. Uh, will, which path will the U.S. choose? Will it be repression or regeneration? Uh, I don't think any of us really know that answer. Uh, it's still undecided. There's still so many decisions yet to be made. Will drones be turned on the U.S. citizenry? What about Ferguson? You know, all these implements of war. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be an interesting question. And what's even more interesting about it is all of the people that uh, have sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, they probably haven't even opened it up and read it. For example, what is a dollar? You know, what's the definition of a dollar? What is a dollar? It's used twice. The term is used twice in the Constitution. Once in the slave provision. And the slave provision, let, it was very hotly contested. So if there, was a, if there was a term in there that they didn't agree on, they probably wouldn't have passed the slave clause, right? And phrase dollars right there in that clause. So what is a dollar? Well, under the 1792 Coinage Act, both Hamilton and Jefferson sent out and had uh, a sampling taken, and they defined the dollar as used in the marketplace. And it was 371.25 grains of fine silver. And that was in Section 8 of the 1792 Coinage Act. Uh, Section 19 provided that any federal officials that debased or made worse the currency shall be guilty of a felony and shall suffer death. So we used to have the death penalty in the United States uh, for, you know, creating lots of uh, debasing the currency, you know, counterfeit inflation, basically. So what is a dollar today? Well, under uh, federal code, 31 U.S.C. 5101 through 5118, we've defined a dollar as one ounce of silver. We've defined $50 as one ounce of gold. We got pennies and nickels and quarters and dimes, all of differing degrees and compositions of copper and zinc and other stuff, and yet they're defined as dollars. And so when you actually write out the equation, does 50 ounces of silver equal one ounce of gold? I don't know if you've taken chemistry class, but no, it doesn't. Uh, and then we have Federal Reserve notes that also are defined as dollars. And so we've, we've got unintelligible federal law defining what the dollar is and making it legal tender, okay? But that's not the sole problem, although it's a huge problem. Think of what problem we would have if we tried to build structures and we defined one foot as three yards which also equaled three inches I mean, buildings would just collapse in on themselves we would have unintelligible ways of performing mental calculations of length of volume of weight and yet when it comes to performing mental calculations of value and the atomic unit of our financial system the dollar that we're using to perform all those calculations is undefined and unintelligible uh, yeah, we have problems. That's why we, that's the root cause of so many of the problems in our society. And if that were it, it would be fine. But it gets even worse because under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5, this, the federal government is given power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. So they're, they're able to actually physically coin the money. Uh, notice it's something coined rather than printed. Uh, and you know, the, that's why the federal mint was uh, minting coins and anybody who debased or made worse the currency shall suffer death uh, for, federal, for federal employees back in 1792. The states, on the other hand, then we get to something called legal tender. So the states, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. So that gets to, to contract law, tort law, uh, things that judges can issue as a judgment, uh, legally binding, right? Because back when the, when the continental dollar failed, you would have debtors paying their creditors without mercy, with worthless continental dollars. You know, I want to pay off my debt with stuff that's not worth anything. It's a good deal, right? For the debtor. 
And so the states somehow, and the federal government somehow, have made Federal Reserve notes legal tender. And yet under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, no state shall emit bills of credit or make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. And then the Tenth Amendment, any powers not delegated uh, are retained to the states or to the people themselves. So the federal government is precluded from making anything legal tender. The states, if they make anything legal tender, it can only be gold and silver. And yet somehow we've got Federal Reserve notes that are legal tender. And yet when the case goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, they refuse to hear it. City versus Dover in 1991 squarely framed this issue. Why? Because it's a political question. Just like the, the Supreme Court wouldn't hear the slave cases and just let it foment under the surface until it exploded in the Civil War, so likewise the Supreme Court will not hear monetary definitions. And they're just let it foment. And so our current system will, will just lurch from one crisis to the other until it accumulates and culminates into either a hyperinflationary explosion or a deflationary depression. Hopefully, Bitcoin will be in there to help ease that transition one way or the other, because in 2007, you had Fortune 500 CEOs calling up Treasury saying, look, if you don't stop this, and it was a run on the bank, basically, $500 billion got moved out in three hours out of money market funds. If you don't stop this, we won't be able to make payroll. What happens to social order and society when Walmart and Exxon and Chevron can't make payroll? Because the lubrication, uh, the, the veins uh, of, of our monetary system grind to a halt due to the lack of trust because nobody believes the other person's balance sheet, the banks in this case. And so that's what, that's another thing that's very fascinating about Bitcoin is that it's not only the blood, the actual currency unit, like the gold or silver, but it's also the veins, which would be like the bank wires or the checks or the credit cards. Uh, and hopefully it can help, help us avert what could otherwise be uh, a very, disturbing situation because make no mistake about it the current monetary and financial system is completely broken and done worldwide and with the dollar being the world reserve currency will be probably the last ones to fully face the consequences but we will be ground zero for them and it's going to be here that the critical questions pose repression or regeneration so not to get off on too much of a tangent, but Bitcoin is so much more complicated and has so many more uh, implications than just, you know, getting a 20% discount on Amazon. Any other questions? Yeah, so the question is, how is Bitcoin a triple entry bookkeeping system? So you've got your traditional debit and your credit, and then you have a confirmation with the network. So when you sign the transaction, uh, that's the debit and credit. You send it to, you broadcast it to the network. A miner picks it up and includes it in a block. And when that block gets confirmed into the blockchain, that's where the confirmation comes, where the triple entry is that proves that that transaction happened. So the, dis, the, the decentralized distributed computing network that's running the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, you would have to follow the rules of the network in order for the network to consider any Bitcoins that you make to be valid. Otherwise, they don't follow the rules and everybody else would say, hey, those aren't real Bitcoins. They, the, the math problem doesn't equal. <laughs> we done? Awesome. Thanks.